The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. Hey guys, do it. The whole theme and concept of the spiritual realm and evil spirits, this is always the most weird part of the Christian worldview for me. And I had to own up to the fact about a year and a half ago that I've just been ignoring, unintentionally or intentionally, I'm not sure how these things work, but like suppressing it and screening it out because it bothers me and it doesn't. I don't know how to make sense of it, and it's hard for me to believe in, frankly. And so what I realized was I just need to head at this whole series of topics, and it's been one of these. You know, you think you know, maybe it's like when you think you know a person, and then you start asking questions you've never asked before, and then you're like, I had no idea, you know, this person that I've been with the whole time. And that's what the experience has been like. Much of what we think we know about the spirit world isn't true. It's been filtered down through centuries of church tradition. Angels do not have wings. Demons don't have horns or tails. And for the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible? Great setup, because it places scholarship and in-depth study and all in this context of sometimes doubt about the supernatural world. Right. Mike, you relate in the book, uh, The Unseen Realm, about your experience reading through Psalm 82. Talk to us a little bit about that experience. I was a doctoral student at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, and again, I, I sketched this out in the first chapter of the book. Um, and I was at a church, I had another you know, fellow there with me who was in the Hebrew department as well. And we were just, you know, killing some time before church, like like we do. And I don't I don't remember what the conversation was about, but I'll never forget the way it ended. He had his Hebrew Bible with him. He opened it up to Psalm 82, and he, you know, didn't shove it at me, but he showed it to me. He said, "You need to read Psalm 82 in Hebrew." And then the next line in the first verse is "Bekerav Elohim Yishpot." In the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. The second Elohim is plural, so you got Elohim twice in the same verse. One is singular, the other is plural. I was struck, as Ben was saying, with the notion that, you know, it's hard to find evangelicals who will just sort of, at this point, let the text say what it says. We have a little trepidation over how, how populated the supernatural world really is. It, it, it brings that, that, that shielding or that veil. As a, as a scholar, Ben, did you look at, uh, had you heard of divine counsel or the Deuteronomy 32 worldview? Like, uh, you know, what's the, what's the broader framework for these things? Uh, when I went up for ordination, they asked me, do you believe in a personal devil? I said, yes. Do you believe in demon possession? I said, yes. Do you believe in angels? I said, yes. They delayed my ordination for a year. Because I, because I believe these things, you know, and I kind of went. Never heard of that before. Wow. Okay. I believe the Bible lets delay more ordination. Yeah, I did that. I'm, I would classify myself as the, uh, the believing skeptic. Okay. I'm, I'm skeptical of every claim, but I'm open to all of them. Right. Um, and every claim about. Every claim about the supernatural or something like this. I, I, I sincerely want to convince Christians, I feel like I'm a missionary to the church, but I, I want to convince Christians to read scripture 
in its own original context, not any particular modern context or denominational context. And if you do that, if you have the Israelite living in your head when you read the Old Testament, first century Jew living in your head when you read the New Testament, you will be able to understand the connectivity across the Testament so much better. And if you're willing to read it as someone predisposed to supernatural characters and events and, and you know just a supernatural worldview you will get so much more out of your bible and i didn't arrive at that academically i had to be provoked um, into jumping in there while i was a while i was a doctoral student but that's kind of what i'm known for now and i've i'm unrepentant <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's, you know, you lose friends, you lose job opportunities, you lose ministry opportunities, but it's a real simple formula. The Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us, but it, its writers and its original readers just didn't think like us. So what can we do to try to think like them and explore scripture? So that, that's really what, what floats the boat here, trying to get good content to the, anybody who cares. I mean, I, I'm not doing stuff for the guild, Yes, I'm published, you know, in academic journals and all that stuff, but where the rubber meets the road is, is anybody who cares, anybody who takes scripture seriously. We are, we are here to produce content for you and, and hopefully it'll, you know, it'll open up scripture to you in new ways. You know, how would, tell us about how Unseen Realm was born, you know, like what motivated you? And it's a one word answer and that is guilt. <laughs> and I, I mean it, you know, I, I can remember in grad school, you know, once I was provoked to go down this road, and I, I tell readers in the first chapter what provoked me, you know, the Psalm 82 thing. But I can remember sitting, you know, working on my dissertation, because my, again, Psalm 82 became a, a focus point. Just here I am a doctoral student, I am not a newbie, I've taught 20 courses, I have two master's degrees, I'm in a PhD program in Hebrew Bible. And I am rediscovering my Bible again, you know, like reading it for the first time again. And I remember thinking, you know, the average Christian in church, you know, and I included myself in that because here I am, you know, experiencing this, but the average Christian will never get to have this experience. You know, and, and you shouldn't have to go to grad school or have, you know, some things provoke you to that. And so that was actually the, the guilt that I felt was where Unseen Realm was born. I thought, you know, I can do that. I can take, you know, peer-reviewed scholarship on this stuff and I can make it decipherable to normal humans. Because <laughs> a lot of it's just technical jargon and just, oh, you know, mind-numbing stuff, you know. Um, but I, I can do that. And so, you know, 15 years later, you know, is when the, the book was actually born. But I, during the process, it was a putter project. It took me over 10 years. And I remember thinking, nobody's ever going to publish this. You know, like, why am I doing this? No, because it was too different. I mean, everybody says their book is different. I actually meant it. <laughs> and it's real, you know. And I thought, nobody's ever going to publish this. So I, I, when I finished the first draft, I posted it on the internet. Out of circumstances, my, my boss you know, finds out that I have this book and we were going to go into print publishing and we're, we're about two years old. And he's like, I heard you have a book. You know, why aren't we doing that? And I said, his name's Bob. I said, okay, Bob, let me see if I understand this correctly. We're going to publish Mike's book and then fire him. <laughs> he's, he's like, why would we do that? We like you. I said, you haven't read it yet, have you? He said, no. And, you know, so I, I provoked him to reading it. Two weeks later, he comes back into my office and shuts the door, which is never a good sign. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, what have you done? I'm never going to read my Bible the same way again. <laughs> what have you done? And I said, you understand, that, you know, don't you? I said, he said, yeah. I said, now, so are you ready if we do this to get the email and the phone call? Why is Heiser working here? You know, are you ready for that? And he's like, bring it on. <laughs> Psalm 82 is similar with, it's a condensed statement 
of the whole storyline of the Bible in terms of the sons of God and the divine counsel and yeah. the role that they play in the storyline. So remember the storyline in Genesis was you have the heavenly rulers and the earthly rulers. Yeah. Both are in rebellion in the course of Genesis 1 to 11. Yeah. Cosmic rebellion mm -hmm. from heavenly and earthly. And what that all leads up to is the Tower of Babylon, mm -hmm. where you have humans who are trying to build up their kingdom in Babylon up into the skies, mm -hmm. right? Across the boundary line. Yeah, get up to the stars. That's right. And then what God does is he scatters Babylon out among the nations. As you look at how later biblical authors think about that event, they see that as yet another cosmic rebellion. Mm -hmm. And in Deuteronomy 32, absolutely crucial. Moses, as he's retelling the story of Israel, he's retelling the story of how God chose Israel out from among the nations. Mm -hmm. ESV, I'm reading. Uh, he looks back and he says, hey, remember the days of old, or go read the book of Genesis. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up humanity. Oh, when in the biblical story did God divide After the, tower of the nations, yeah. the scattering of Babylon? And God knew what he was doing. He fixed the borders or he fixed the yeah, territories of the people according to the number of the sons of Elohim. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Totally. Yeah. He's like, okay, you people get this angel, this heavenly host. You get this one, you get this one. <laughs> yes. There's a heavenly and earthly rebellion. Yeah. And essentially what Moses is saying, what's happening there is God was disinheriting humanity, hmm. handing them over to the rebel sons of God. Hmm. And again, you don't just get that from here. You get it from reading Deuteronomy yeah. 32 in light of all the sons of God stuff in Deuteronomy, which is in chapter 4, 11, and 29, in light of Genesis 6 and 11. I'm so sorry, you guys. But it's, 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 by, the people who wrote these books are total nerds. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and they assume that you are You're tracking nerd, with everything yeah. as you go yeah. along. translated gods in Psalm 82 is Elohim. Now most of the time it should be translated as capital G, God, but sometimes it's plural. And Psalm 82 one has both. The problem for us is that we think this is a problem for monotheism, but it's not. We're taught to associate the letters G, O, and D with a specific set of unique attributes. That's why putting an S on the end makes us queasy. But the word Elohim is not about a set of unique attributes. The Bible itself tells us that. Psalm 82 places the heavenly host in a council. That term is appropriate because these beings participate in God's rule of the world. Now certainly God doesn't need their help, but he lets them participate. Consider the strange story that the prophet Micaiah gave to the wicked Israelite king Ahab. Therefore, Hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne, with all the hosts of heaven standing beside him, from his right hand and from his left hand. And Yahweh said, Who will entice Ahab, so that he will go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Then this one was saying one thing, and the other one was saying another. Then a spirit came out and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. And Yahweh said to him, How? He said, I will go out, and I will be a false spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You shall entice and succeed. Go out and do so. So then, see that Yahweh has placed a false spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and Yahweh has spoken disaster concerning you. Did you catch what the Bible asked you to believe? God meets with his heavenly host to decide what happens on earth? Yeah, we caught that. I hope you guys are enjoying this video. The Divine Council is such an important theme and it blew my mind a couple years ago when I first discovered it from Tim Mackey and Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, this video is set out to give a defense of the Divine Council worldview. So often now, since I've presented this theme uh, to other Christians, I'm, I'm met with a lot of pushback. And I get it. It's not something that we've been taught over the past hundred years, but it's something that's integral and 
intimately woven into our Bibles. So the Divine Council worldview today, we're defending it, and we're going to uh, let Dr. Mike Kaiser, Tim Mackey, really delve into Psalm 82, because a lot of the critics will say that Jesus quotes Psalm 82 and is trying to refer Psalm 82 as the speaking about humans and not the divine council or the spiritual beings that God has appointed to rule over the nations. So over this next couple segments, you guys are going to see a defense against that. And I want us all to be ready to have a defense against that so that we can stand uh, in the truth of God's word and to be able to display the hope that it all has. My hope is that you guys will subscribe. I am so excited for what God's doing with this channel and the growth that is happening is blowing my mind. Uh, I really want that to continue. I want this message to get out to as many people as possible so that we can provide hope. And there's a lot of hope uh, with understanding the Bible on its own terms and what God has done for our world through Jesus. So if you could, hit that subscribe button, share the content, press the like button. All of these things help get this message out to others. And I'm so grateful that you're here and I'm so grateful for this channel and what God's doing. Let's get back to defending the divine counsel. We're about to meet Tim Mackey and John Collins uh, in a question and answer series that they did live with a Bible Project podcast. And they're going to directly answer uh, the questions against Jesus quoting Psalm 82. So let's check that out. We have another question. Another question. I think Ryan Craycraft. Uh, yeah, my name is Ryan Dillon, and I'm asking on behalf of Ryan Craycraft from Middletown, Ohio. Tim, you mentioned that Elohim only refers to a non-physical spiritual being. However, when reading John 10, 34 and 35, when being accused of blasphemy by the Jews for making himself God, Jesus appears to quote Psalm 82. Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods, when speaking directly to Jews? What is your take on Jesus' response here? And how do both the scriptures of John 10 and Psalm 82 relate to Elohim used in Exodus 22, where the word yeah. judges was translated from Elohim? Yeah, we got about 12 different versions of this very question. Yeah. To set it up for context. So essentially what Psalm 82 is, it's a reflection on that the mirror of heavenly and earthly rulers. And so Psalm 82 just comes out of the gate and says, yeah, God takes place. It's like a day in the heavenly courtroom. Mm. He comes and takes a seat in the divine council. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the Elohim, he renders judgment. Mm -hmm. So God's ticked about how the sons of God are participating in the cosmic rebellion. So in Psalm 82, God's showing up and he's saying like, no more, mm. this is done for. So he says that the sons of God, the cosmic rebels, be a good band name, cosmic rebels, are foolish. They don't have knowledge. And so what God says is, you know what? I made you Elohim. I said you are Elohim. Y'all are sons of the Most High. But nevertheless, you are going to die like mortals. Mm. And fall like in Hebrew, echad esarim, like one of the princes. There's one princely son of Elohim that has fallen, mm. and the rest of you are going to fall. fall like that one. And then look at the last one. Arise, O God, judge the earth, because what is God after in the whole storyline of the Bible? To bring everyone back. To inherit all, not just one people group. In order to do that, he actually totally. has to take care of That's right. these. That's exactly right. Cosmic rebels. rebels. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Psalm 82 is crucially important. It's essentially the same storyline as Daniel 7 of God judging the beasts, oh, right. the beastly rulers yeah. of heaven and earth mm -hmm. and installing Elevating the true the son human of man. one on the divine throne yeah. next to him. Okay, that's Psalm 82. That's Psalm 82. And Jesus in John 10. And Jesus really cared about Psalm 82. Yeah. He quotes from it. In John chapter 10, we're going to go with the New American Standard. He just finishes up a, a light conversation claiming as the culmination to what came before. I and the Father are one. So drop that one at a party. And uh, <laughs> people will stare at you. So people pick up stones. They didn't like that. I and the Father are one. Yeah. So um, Jesus is like, what? I healed a blind man. And you're going to kill me, right? For doing good works from the Father? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's because of blasphemy. You're a mortal, and you're making yourself out to be God, as God. And Jesus said, have you ever read the Bible? 
And he says, is it written in uh, your Torah? But then he quotes from the Psalms. So this is interesting, actually. In this period, this happens a lot in the New Testament, that the apostles and Jesus will use the word Torah to refer to the whole Hebrew Bible. Mm. Jesus does it multiple times. What's that called? A metonymy? I get these wrong. Hey. The part for the whole. Yeah, the part for the whole. So the Torah is the first part of the scriptures. Yeah, and it can refer to the whole thing. Because clearly yeah. he's saying, isn't it written in the Torah? And yeah. he quotes yeah. from, from the Psalms. Yeah. So isn't it written in the scriptures? And he quotes Psalm 82. I, I said, said you, you are gods. gods. Yep. Now, if God called Elohim, mm -hmm. or in Greek, uh, Theos, those to whom the word of God came, and scripture is reliable, mm -hmm. Why do you, do you say of the one whom the Father has sanctified, that is set apart as holy, and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I say, I am the Son of God? Is everybody clear? So wait, his logic <laughs> is because in Psalm 82, yeah. there are other Elohims, yeah. then That's right. why can't Jesus be one? Is that his logic? So he's just been called out. You are making yourself... As God, yeah, and I and the Father are one. Yeah. So whatever his appeal to Psalm 82, it's bolstering that claim that he just made, yeah, and he's right. about to make it again. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Hmm. So his appeal to Psalm 82 is an argument to say, listen, I'm not blaspheming, and I'm not crazy. So he's appealing to Psalm 82 to say, listen, there are beings that God can call His sons that are higher than humans. Mm -hmm. And they're legitimately called the sons of Elohim. It's mm -hmm. the conversation we just had earlier. Yeah. Right? There's a category for the divine council. Yeah. Sons of Elohim. And no one would have argued with that. Totally. Yeah. Right. That's exactly right. That's his point. So if you all acknowledge in your Bible that there are members of the spiritual being category, yeah. then why is it so crazy that I am claiming because that I am a human who's completely one with Elohim? That's his argument. That's his argument. Yes. It's still crazy. Yeah, but his point is that if you've read the Hebrew Bible, you mm -hmm. have shelf space yeah. for beings that aren't just mortal and for beings that share in characteristics of God's heavenly being, yeah. but that aren't the one true God. And what's crazy about these sons of God, that they also are spirit beings, but in the Bible they show up physically sometimes. Yeah, that's right. To finish responding to Ryan's point, so many people think that the Elohim in Psalm 82 are humans being called Elohim. And you can actually see this in the New International, excuse me, the New American Standard Version. They just use the word rulers in yeah. the place of Elohim. Right. That obscures that it's the word Elohim. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's normally God. Yeah. So that has led many people to think that in John chapter 10, um, Jesus is appealing to Psalm 82 as if uh, he's saying that Psalm 82 is talking about humans. But the ones to whom the word of God comes in Psalm 82 are Elohim. So there aren't any clear examples of humans being called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. This is so nerdy. But in, um, in the book of Exodus, there's a law that says, hey, listen, when a thief gets caught in ancient Israel uh, and you want to hold him to account, then bring him before the New American Standard has the judges. And then they tell you in a footnote, oh, actually, or God. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh. That's a big difference. That seems like a really big difference. Yeah. Can you guess what the Hebrew word is? Elohim. Elohim, yes. So uh, the English Standard Version, the thief is found, he shall come near to God. Mm -hmm. Elohim. There are some people who think that this is so clearly talking about bring him before a courtroom. So the, not capital G God, but the sons of yeah, God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, but for the Israelites to come to God in Exodus 22 is Would to, be go to, to, the, the, to go to the tabernacle. The chief God. To go to the tent there, yeah. with Moses. Yeah. And numerous places, actually, here, I'll just show you one, just because Ryan Craigcraft, I'm sure you're going to appreciate this. Check out Deuteronomy 19, 16. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, both parties of the dispute shall appear before the Lord, namely before the priests and before the judges. So here's a case where somebody's accused of something and they are brought before Elohim, mm -hmm. right? Yahweh is an Elohim. And then when I want to make clear that I also mean the human judges, you just name them. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So in Exodus 22, the fact that the human judges aren't mentioned is significant. 
when you're bringing your case before judges appointed by God, you're bringing it before God. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. And so people who want to make an argument that Exodus 22 is a use of humans being called Elohim, it's just a bad argument. You just don't want to do that. First and foremost, you should be aware of some of the ways the clear meaning of Psalm 82 is distorted by interpreters and why it isn't teaching polytheism. Divine beings are not human. Many Christians who object to the plain meaning of the Hebrew text of Psalm 82 assert that this psalm is actually describing God the Father speaking to the other members of the Trinity. This view results in heresy. I'm confident you can see why. The psalm has God judging the other Elohim for corruption. The corrupt Elohim are sentenced to die like humans. These observations alone should make any Christian who cares about the doctrine of God abandon this idea. It has other flaws. The end of the psalm makes it evident that the Elohim being chastised were given some sort of authority over the nations of the earth, a task at which they failed. This doesn't fit the Trinity. Other Christians who see the problems with this first idea try to argue that the sons of God are human beings, Jews to be specific. Some Jewish readers, who obviously would not be Trinitarian, also favor this view. The human view is as flawed as the Trinitarian view. At no point in the Old Testament does the Scripture teach that Jews or Jewish leaders were put in authority over the other nations. The opposite is true. They were to be separate from other nations. The covenant with Abraham presupposed this separation. If Israel was wholly devoted to Yahweh, other nations would be blessed. Humans are also not by nature disembodied. The word Elohim is a place of residence term. Our home is the world of embodiment. Elohim, by nature, inhabit the spiritual world. The real problem with the human view, though, is that it cannot be reconciled with other references to the Hebrew Old Testament that refer to a divine council of Elohim. Psalm 89, 5-7 Hebrew verses 6 to 8, explicitly contradicts the notion of a divine council in which the Elohim are humans. And so the heavens will praise your wonderful deed, O Yahweh, even your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the sky is equal to Yahweh? Who is like Yahweh among the sons of God? A God feared greatly in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all surrounding him. God's divine counsel is an assembly in the heavens, not on earth. The language is unmistakable. This is precisely what we'd expect if we understand the Elohim to be divine beings. It is utter nonsense if we think of them as humans. There is no reference in Scripture to a council of human beings serving Yahweh in the skies, Jews or otherwise. What Psalms 82 and 89 describe is completely consistent with what we saw earlier in Job 38.7, a group of heavenly sons of God. It also accords perfectly with other references to the sons of God as plural Elohim. The sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, Job 1.6 and 2.1. Ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of God, Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory due His name. Psalm 29, 1 and 2. Do these references describe a group of Jewish leaders, among whom, in the passage of Job, Yahweh's great adversary appears, leading to Job's suffering? The conclusion is obvious. God addressed his counsel when he created the first man and woman. The counsel was already there. So God created humankind in his image. In the likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
God told his heavenly family he wanted to create humanity. Now, people often think God addressed the other members of the Trinity, but that is not the case. The other members of the Trinity are co-equal and co-omniscient. God wouldn't need to tell them anything. God speaks to his heavenly host here. Job 38 tells us the sons of God were present at the creation. Where were you at my laying the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars were singing together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Jesus and the apostles so assume the divine counsel mm. and like once you see it and how they think and talk and write, it's everywhere. You can't mm. unsee it. And so it's clear that for them it's the exact opposite is true. The belief in a populated spiritual world, it's a mirror of the populated earthly world. For them, that makes even more clear Jesus' identity as the son, the ultimate son of Elohim. For the apostles, it actually clarifies that Jesus isn't a creature, but is actually one with the creator. In the history of Christian orthodoxy, where groups have gone off the rails and identified Jesus as one of the sons of Elohim alongside the other sons of Elohim, mm -hmm. what it usually is, is it's Somewhere in the European Western tradition, people just misunderstanding all of this divine counsel language in the Bible. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's not that the concept of the divine counsel is what is leading people down the wrong path. It's just that we don't have room for it in our worldview, and so we have no idea what these authors are talking about. Yeah. Now, Psalm 82 6 says God has sons, sons of the Most High is the phrase. I have said, You are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. Who are these sons of God? It sounds odd. What about Jesus? How can there be all these other sons of God? For example, we've yep. talked about the phrase, the sons of Elohim. Mm -hmm. That's the Hebrew way of saying just members of the spiritual realm. Okay. Just like, like sons of Adam is members of the human realm. Yeah, totally. Or um, Elijah and Elisha always have hanging around them a crew called the sons of the prophets. Mm. And it's not their sons. Yeah. Like they didn't have many it's, wives. It's, and like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. So it just means members of the little prophetic crew they had going on. Got it. It was their posse. It's like sons of Adam. Is the prophetic posse. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not all brothers yeah. of some biker gang guy. That's right. Yeah. So when the phrase is used in the plural like this, it just means members of that category. Yeah, okay. So when we see this in, you know, the classic one is Genesis 6, and the sons of God, the spiritual beings. Hmm. The spiritual beings. Yeah. So I think where this trips people up then is they say, oh, look, okay, well, God has many sons. Right. So when you go to chapter one of Romans and you see, oh, here's Jesus. He's declared the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Oh, he's just, he's one of the sons of one God. One of the sons of God, yeah. That's ignoring how this language works in the Bible. The New Testament authors just come out of the gate swinging, set Jesus as the son of God, as a category entirely of its own, to make it clear that they don't think Jesus is a created being, that he is another category altogether. Mm -hmm. He is Yahweh incarnate. Mm -hmm. So they do this multiple ways. One is to call him the word become human, the divine word mm -hmm. and purpose become a human being. But then in this phrase that the biblical authors use, uh, the one and only, the one and only son. Yeah. So what they're doing there is they're using a phrase, in Greek it's monogenes, meaning the unique and one and only son, to set Jesus apart from the sons of Elohim and from any other son of Elohim that you've read about in the Hebrew Bible. They're putting Jesus in a category completely of his own. That through these, you may become sharers of the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world. Being partakers of the divine nature means we will be like God. We will have a body like Jesus did after the resurrection. We will have eternal life, and with the loyal members of the heavenly host, we will be in God's family and worship him forever.
God will succeed in uniting his divine and human family for eternity. But the most amazing part of being in God's family is how Jesus, the unique Son of God, sees us. When Jesus became a man, he was made for a short time a little lower than the angels. Listen to the writer to the Hebrews. But now, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we see Jesus, for a short time made lower than the angels, so that apart from God, he might taste death on behalf of everyone. Because God became man in Jesus, his mortal followers will become like him and members of God's family. We are Jesus' siblings and the fruit of his ministry. He is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing in praise of you. And again, behold, I am the children God has given me. It's stunning that Jesus is not ashamed to call mere mortals his brothers and sisters. In fact, in the presence of the divine council, he revels in introducing God to us and us to God. Consider the reason that Paul gives for our glorification. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers. The exaltation of Jesus is the reason for our glorification. He is the firstborn, or the head, the one who receives the inheritance among many brothers. John puts this even more succinctly. We will be like him. Until that day, God wants us to tell the epic story of his war against supernatural rebellion, to help him release those still held captive by unseen powers of darkness. I want this message to get out to as many people as possible so that we can provide hope. And there's a lot of hope uh, with understanding the Bible on its own terms and what God has done for our world through Jesus. So if you could, hit that subscribe button, share the content, press the like button. All of these things help get this message out to others. And I'm so grateful that you're here and I'm so grateful for this channel and what God's doing.